Hi, I'm Yegi. I'm an entrepreneur and success coach who wants it all. Family, luxury, career, and the freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I want. And I'll do whatever it takes to get there. I created the Yegi Project to document my journey and inspire others to do the same. My mission is to change the world by influencing and leading others to do what they love and live fulfilled lives. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in today. I am Yegi from the Yegi Project. And today we have Lauren Polly, who is our special guest and specializes in mental health. So I'm going to um, give the mic to her, let her introduce herself and let us know a little bit about who she is, what she does and what her passion is. Hello, everybody. I'm Lauren Polly. Uh, I specialize in what I call the mental wealth movement. So instead of kind of staying to the basic, let's survive the day, I'm all about let's actually thrive in today and oh, develop I love our that. uniqueness. Yeah, I am. Um, I was playing around with the words and I'm like, mental health just doesn't seem to capsulate it all. We need something a little bit more big and expansive. So um, mental wealth is really about the wealth of your being and being radically authentic and using your kind of weird, quirky traits, which in my case, won me a mental health diagnosis when I was a teenager, uh, using that as like a viable asset in your life, either if you're creating a business or going after a career or a relationship, just so all of you gets to shine where we're not really living by a label or slotted into these tiny little um, kind of make-believe roles that we put ourselves in, you know? Wonderful. Yes, I definitely have to agree. So can you tell our listeners a, li a little bit about your work, your day to day? What do you spend your time on with your coaching, with the message you're trying to spread and all of that? Mm -hmm. So I have a multi-award winning book called The Other Side of Bipolar, and that is my personal journey. I always say it's a memoir slash self-help book because it's kind of a mashup of the two. The whole purpose is that the reader gets to walk with me and discover for themselves what may actually unlock and oh, unleash themselves. That. Yeah. So um, I, I do a lot of writing. I do coaching with high-end clients, so people who are really successful, but they're not really feeling as authentic as they want to be, and they're curious about those things that they put on the shelf or shoved down. Uh, like for me, my empathy was one that I had to do because I was overly sensitive growing up. And that's what a lot of my mental health issue were, being very empathetic, actually kind of taking on stuff from others. And uh, it took a long road for myself to be able to unpack that fully so that I can connect as deep as I want to. And coaching fits right in with that. I love that. Well, tell us a little bit about your journey. So what made you want to get into this line of work? So my journey began when I was 14 and diagnosed. Um, even at that stage, it was so funny because I was always like the helper. I was taking everybody to the school counselor's office. I had a friend who was cutting herself. I had someone else who was unfortunately getting molested in her family situation. Um, but to me, they had like real problems. It was something really concrete where they were in danger, they needed help. So I was constantly taking them to the counselor's office to get that. It never really occurred to me to speak up for my own needs. And just, it's hard, I think, sometimes when you're having a mental health issue that's not tied to anything specific, like an outside situation like these other girls. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just very uncomfortable and I didn't like myself and I didn't understand how the world worked and my part in it. And because of that, I was thinking of committing suicide. But again, because I didn't have words for it and because it wasn't super concrete, it wasn't like I felt able or willing even to speak up. Um, so I think yeah. it really kind of comes back to that point of my passion for giving people language, making it safe to explore. And a lot of those mm -hmm. things where, again, there's not an external circumstance. It's just the way you feel inside. Something's not matching up. How can you get the help that you need? Wow, that must have been really hard. I mean, as a teenager to recognize that and be diagnosed with a mental illness. Um, can you share that experience with you? Like, because I'm sure a lot of people go through that even as adults, and they, they don't really recognize it. So in your case, what is some advice that you would give to our listeners? Like, what do they need to listen to in them? That's not right for them to be like, okay, this might be a hint or a clue that I may need to seek help. 
Yeah, I think you need to seek help when you're non-functional. So a lot of us have ups and downs and bumps along the way. That's normal. Um, I always say people get so confused with the mental health journey of thinking that eventually you're going to land up on a placid sea and nothing's going to bother you ever again. Uh, that's not life. That's not realistic. Uh, but I think where you really need to reach out is when you are having those non-functional moments. You can't get out of bed in the morning. Like younger, you can't complete your homework. I totally lost interest in everything. Becoming mm -hmm. uh, more of a recluse and kind of keeping to yourself or having outbursts, uh, those are more, those are bigger warning signs. But it's interesting because so many people are getting diagnosed now, especially at a young, young age. And my journey through the Western medical model was helpful at the time, but it was also very limiting because they just love to put the label on you and they give you therapy centering around that. It took a mm -hmm. long time until I actually found a holistic psychiatrist. And he was the one who's oh, like, yeah. you're a person, you're not the label. And now we have to talk about the entirety of you and what that looks like in your future. That's what really changed it for me. So, um, Oh, wow. Yeah, I could definitely see the two different approaches. One is probably more very like cookie cutter base and one is very specialized base. It's like, okay, this is what you're diagnosed with, but it could be so many different versions. You're unique as a person of how to handle it or how to approach it that works for you. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting because we don't, well, we don't really look at like the whole mind, body, spirit. And I feel like we are now mm -hmm. when I was diagnosed, oh, 14, it's been 30 years about, um, that wasn't really a conversation. So I feel like there's way more information out there. So if you are in therapy, I would say seek some alternative practices as well. Things that build up your wealth bank, not just your health bank. And um, that in of itself is going to help develop all of you, not just the label, you know? Wow. Okay, good. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that advice. Now, just for our listeners to get to know you a little bit better. What is one thing that most people don't know about you, even that you have a book and you know, you're out there, but what is one thing that most people don't know about you? Oh, um, I would say I'm incredibly intuitive to the point where I can <laughs> not only read people's energies, but sometimes their brains, it pops out of my mouth before <laughs> it pops out of theirs. <laughs> um, and it's fascinating because my career, has been as a medical speech language pathologist. So I've spent 18 years working okay. with stroke victims in the hospital who've lost the ability to talk. Um, so I oh, think that wow. innate ability to kind of read somebody without the words has been um, uber developed in my in my world. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's very interesting. Um, how how is that? Do you feel like it's a it's a tool that benefits you, or does it does it get in your way? Sometimes you know I don't know if we really want to know what people are thinking. <laughs> you don't want to know what people are thinking, and you definitely don't want to be the one to say it before they're ready to say it, and that's happened quite a few times. So you kind of have to check yourself a little bit as you're talking. Um, but I find it's always been super helpful because I can connect deeper. And this is what I mean by kind of the weird things that may have gotten you diagnosed or the things you don't like about yourself being an asset. Uh, for me, okay. that was a huge thing because when I was in my teenage years, I was picking up on all sorts of crap from all over the place. I mean, think about junior high. It's horrible, right? Um, so a lot of the stuff that I thought was personal and about me, I was just picking it up from other people, all their weird and a personal dynamics I had nothing to do with, but I felt like it was happening to me. Um, but later on being able to harness that now I can utilize it in my clients and it makes a huge difference. They feel seen and heard, you know? Wow. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I am a big believer of any experience that we go through. It is building who we are and somehow becoming part of our tools, you know, in our toolbox of what we can use down the line. So even the worst situations I feel like I've been in, I've looked at it that way. And um, ultimately it does end up being like, oh, OK, well, I went through this even horrible experience, but it added up to, you know, teaching me all these things and making me gain all these tools in order for me to be able to solve X, Y and Z, you know, down the future. So I definitely um, I definitely know what you're talking about. Yeah. I think that's what makes people successful though, because that's the resiliency. And when you can't look at it that way and you're stuck in victim, you're never going to move forward. But if you can adopt that mindset that you have, Yegi, that's beautiful. It's what most of us need. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the word victim and I've been around a lot of people just throughout my life that I've, I've start. I noticed that, you know, they end up acting or 
treating themselves as the victim in their life situation that they're not happy with versus um, owning up to, okay, this is what it is. These are my options. This is what I can do. This is what I have the power to do instead of feeling sorry for themselves, you know, putting themselves in that victim shoe that the outside people, the outside um, uh, things, environment, like made them this way. How, what advice from your professional point of view, what advice would you give um, to those people who are maybe feeling down or feeling out of control or feeling like a victim, um, but don't necessarily realize that's that that's what they're doing yeah I think it's a hard reality check for a lot of people and you kind of have to take a beat like it sucks to go through this it sucks to go through what I did when I was younger I wouldn't wish it on anybody um and so sometimes you need that moment because I find so many people are so desperate not to be a victim that they're sugarcoating everything and they're never actually Mm -hmm. able to move forward because they just take whatever it is and shove it deep 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 down um so first of all I would have that moment of self-pity or just self-compassion and just realness with yourself. And then you really have to figure out how to pull your bootstraps up and get going. Um, For me, it was a big thing, especially during my young adult years, like in my early 20s, when I was much healthier from a mental standpoint, but also like creating my life in graduate school. And I just got to the point like, no one's going to pay my bills for me. If I make a mistake, it's on my name, not anybody else's. You can't keep playing victim to other people's external crap. You really have to pull it together if you want to be a success. So whatever you need to do to kind of have that, but definitely have that moment of self-compassion too, because if you don't, you're never really dealing with the real issue. Oh, I see. Like you're just looking past it and uh, you said sugar coating so you're just kind of denying it and ignoring it instead of dealing with it and healing from it and then moving on yeah it's like what you said yagi like you use those circumstances to be like i'm learning a tool here and if you don't have that moment to be like wow this situation's horrible you kind of don't have that real moment with yourself it's it's energetically like somebody's kind of bouncing away from it I always kind of think of like a ping pong ball um Mm -hmm. and they're never really able to land and you may be around people like that in your life where no matter what you can't really connect with them they just kind of feel like they're bouncing away constantly or in constant motion so I feel like there's something really beautiful about landing for a second and getting real and then moving forward I see. Yes. Okay. So here's another fun question and it doesn't have to be, you know, what we want to hear just from your first instinct of what comes to mind. If you can change anything in the world with a magic wand, um, and there is no limits, what would it be? It would be this world running on judgment. Okay. Constant, and why? constant, constant judgment. And for me, it's not the, like, like the external judgment where people are like, I like you or I don't like you or you're good at this or you're bad at that. Um, Cause it just creates this external measuring stick where no matter what you're trying to live up to other people's viewpoint of you. But I think more than that, it's this internal thing because so many of us are so aware that before we know it, we just pick up, even if it's not our natural tendency, and that judgment comes internal. And before you know it, you're your own self-critic. And it's never about, I love myself, I'm beautiful, I'm healthy, this moment's wonderful. It's not that. It's more about, I need to do better, I, I messed up there. It's just a constant thing. And when you pick things up from people's heads like I do, it's a barrage of yuckiness. <laughs> Yes, we're always our worst critic. And and you're right, if we do the average person or if we do pay attention to all the talk we do to ourselves, it is most of the time negative self talk, we're always picking at our worst, we're not looking at the good things and we're not complimenting ourselves. Um, I personally have worked on this on myself. So now I'm aware. So when I catch myself doing the negative self talk, I'll be um, like, okay, no, 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 let's pick on let's pick something that you know, you're good at or you're proud of or that you like on yourself if it's image related or whatever it is so I think um I don't know what advice you have on that my just from my life experience it's been just really being aware of it and just trying to put an end to it trying to stop it anytime you do the negative talk try to do like say two extra things good about yourself to kind of you know make yourself feel better in a way, but hopefully break that habit of the negative self-talk. I always think of it like a flip of 
okay, if I wasn't having this as an internal dialogue and it wasn't about myself, but it was something I was saying literally to another human being, would I still okay. say it? And it's like, oh no, okay. because if that came out directed at somebody, it would be so mean and nasty. Like I would never do that. So why is it in my head directed wow, at myself? I love, that. <laughs> I love that. That's a great way of thinking about it. You know, I, yeah. Wow. I'm going to use yeah, that. That one's super helpful. <laughs> it's like if you, would you say, yeah, that's, that's super helpful. So it's like, would you, would you tell somebody what you're telling yourself out loud? And if not, don't tell yourself that, put an end to it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so let's talk about challenges. We all have challenges in our lives, right? So one of your big ones, I'm sure, as you mentioned, was being diagnosed and going through that whole journey of figuring yourself out, right, with your diagnosis. Um, oh, uh, what? Uh, well, I guess I'm assuming because that's what you mentioned. But what is one of the biggest challenges you had to go through in your life or in your business? And how did you overcome it? I think that there was two two big points. So one was definitely going through the mental health angst when I was younger. And I feel like that was kind of like the grace of God or the grace of spirit that really helped me. You know, um, I really had to lean on my family, especially if you're underage. I was lucky to be surrounded by people who were supportive. Um, I think the bigger change point really came when I was older and I was really, like I said, creating my life, getting my master's, starting my business. And that was this insanity number two, I call it in my life, where I am such a perfectionist that I drove myself insane with this hypercritical talk. I can't move till it's all perfect. As an entrepreneur, it kills whatever you're creating. And then just in your yes, daily yes, life, yes. it's such a such a touchstone for judgment to start to form. So for me, that that inner critic, that perfection tendency, and I think a lot of it came from being younger and being like, well, you know, something's off with me because that's what they tell you when you're diagnosed. So therefore, if I'm perfect on the outside, nobody will ever know. So I had to really oh. kind of heal that deeper wound and then really look at where that perfection on the outside was um, kind of overwhelming everything. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people, including myself, I used to be a perfectionist and I used to blame it on being a Virgo. <laughs> like too, Virgos I'm are known Virgo to be so. <laughs> <laughs> how funny yeah so I wouldn't blame it on that and I was like you know what no like I'm not gonna just say that's what I am and stick to it like it doesn't work that way and maybe I haven't thought about it but maybe I have some sort of deeper thing that's had made me want to look or be perfect in certain areas but I did realize that was some point and I think it is when I started my business back in 2015 so and I was like no 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 like this doesn't matter and my my story was was the shopping bag. So I spent so much time on designing these very simple, they're just black shopping bags with a logo in the center on both sides. But I spent so much time and effort like perfecting the exact size of the logo, the material of the paper, which size bags I wanted to be like super perfect. It really didn't matter, but it drove me crazy. It put me back on my like calendar and all that. And then once I realized that I was like, oh no, like it has to be just good enough so then that became my thing I was like okay no 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 nothing's gonna be perfect definitely not in business it just has to be good enough for me to move on because if I'm gonna spend four weeks a month on just a design of a shopping bag that's the, that looks so simple <laughs> I'm not gonna get anywhere with my business plan right so um, I think that's the way I was able to get over it is just realizing how crazy I'm being and just saying, okay, it just has to be good enough and move on. Give myself a deadline and wherever I'm at at that point, it's getting published or it's getting, you know, it's, it's, it's a go. We're not looking at it anymore. What's your techniques for that? How did you kind of put an end to perfectionism? Because I, I, I do work with a lot of entrepreneurs, so and I know it's a big issue with, with entrepreneurs. They want their business plan to be perfect. They want location to be perfect, anything to be perfect that procrastinates them from actually taking action towards their dream of owning a, or starting a business. So is there anything you can share for um, for our listeners to that would help them yeah. to not worry about perfectionism? Well, the perfectionism is really 
really a crutch. I mean, if you're actually looking deep, deep down, it's keeping you procrastinating. And it's also keeping you in that planning stage, not the launching stage. So I would say if you are kind of caught in that cul-de-sac of round and around and around you go and never actually putting anything out, you really need to have that conversation with yourself of, are you ready? And are you actually willing to be seen to be heard. And sometimes your life changes when you're an entrepreneur. People see you in a different way. And that can be really confronting for people. That was super confronting for me, especially before my book, because it's my personal story. Um, I wrote uh-huh. the whole thing and it came out way more raw and vulnerable than I was anticipating uh, to the point where I was like, you know, I don't yeah. even know if I'm going to put this out in the world. This might just be a <laughs> cathartic exercise for myself. Just for myself. <laughs> um, and then by the time I was done with it, I'm like, no, no, people really need to hear and to read this because it will unlock people, uh, which it has. And it's awesome. But, you know, it's a multi-award winning. It's a best selling book. So a lot yeah. of people have read it. And to meet people who don't know me, but who know every little weird thing about me. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I can imagine. And so many businesses are really like that these days. Like they're heart-centered or they're, um, what do they call it? Um, Soulpreneur. There's another term for it where basically you're the front person for the business. So it's a lifestyle business. Yes, you're the face. Of it. You have to, that's, that's kind of the thing now, you know, if you want your business to be successful, you want people to, especially for small business, you want people to connect with you, you want them to like you, you want them to, you know, share your vision, your story, they're not just buying something, they want to support you. So but I think that's where um, people get can, stuck, because it's like putting yourself out there in that way. So you kind of stay in that perfection oh. thing. So you look outside. And um, But you have to realize that people really connect with your imperfections. They connect when you mess up. Like my strongest content has been, this is what I'm going through and I'm struggling right now. And here's how I'm working through it. I'm mid process. Are you too? And that's where I get a lot of the response because people are like, you're still walking with me, even though you're where I would hope Mm -hmm. to be, you're still walking the path. So I feel like you need a big mindset shift around that. And how can you use that? And actually put yourself out there, you know? Yeah, actually, that I think that has been my weakness, too. And I think it still probably is part of my weakness. I, I try to, like, if there is an issue, I try to work on it and make sure it's good or I'm good at it or something before I really feel com- com- comfortably, like, sharing it, talking about it. I feel like I need to give people a solution, right, instead of just that. But um, I think part of my journey, too, is was creating this podcast. That's why it's called The Yegi Project, because <laughs> I do want people to know that I am also constantly working on myself. We all should be, you know, it's it's a constant thing. We, we don't just get to be one place and everything's perfect right we um but i i really love that you share that because including myself i'm sure there's a lot of people who feel like oh they can't share something unless it's perfect and also there's a great saying called um speak from the scar not the wound and i think that's fantastic advice By the time I put my book out, it was a scar that I was talking about. It wasn't an open wound. And I feel like had I written it when I was younger and I was still really in it, um, it sometimes sounds more like a sob story. It's overdramatic. You can kind of read off of people's content. So that might be if you're struggling with the perfection thing and it's more of a personal thing you're putting out in the world, maybe really ask and be Mm -hmm. honest with yourself. Am I speaking from the scar or am I still in that wound stage? And maybe it's just going to take a little Mm -hmm. bit more time to kind of seal that sucker up before you go. Before we can really um, talk about it, I guess, before being like, too emotionally involved. So you could be a little bit more logical or healed from it. I see. I could, I could definitely see that. And also when you're that. putting yourself up in that way, just so you know, you're, you're going to be opening yourself up to judgment. I think a lot of people don't put themselves out because people are cruel on social media. They're people who aren't going to agree with you. They're people who don't agree with me and my approach. Um, so I feel like if you're still on that wound stage and then you're meeting that negative comment, that's a lot to take in. So there's just these conversations to have oh, before you launch okay. out. 
Oh, I love that. So you're right. I can see being a lot more vulnerable when my wounds open and getting comments. But if I've healed and it's just a scar now, Mm -hmm. then it's not going to get to me as much because I'm not as upset or as hurt about it. Oh, I love that. I never heard it that way. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so next question. Uh, This one's a fun one. Um, Again, you don't have to overthink it, but it is a deep question if you were to really think about it. But just... The first thing that comes to mind, what what does a um, fulfilled life look like to you? I mean, to me, that's just <laughs> that's just more of an energy thing. That's just like yeah, like some, a happy, fulfilled life, like sumptuous, like firing on all c- cylinders. And for me, like one way I work with myself and also with my clients, because a lot of people are successful in a lot of areas, but they're like kind of lagging in another, or they're wanting in another. Really having like an inventory of like how's my body reality, my relationship with my health, and also my deliciousness in my body, my massages and my nature time, Um, my relationship reality, looking at the people I'm surrounding myself with, uh, my creative reality, am I pushing my creative boundaries? Um, Also looking at your financial reality, making sure that you're firing on cylinders there and taking care of yourself. So for me, like that fulfilled life is where I'm firing on all all cylinders in all those areas. So it's not like one area is super great. So I always go So what were those areas? So I go off of body. So that's like your okay. whole, your um, your domesticity. So where you're living, what you're doing, your day to day health and wellness, and how your body is feeling. Uh, relationship is another one. So romantic relationships, friendships, that kind of thing. Uh, creative reality, that's a huge one. Are you actually exploring and putting yourself out and kind of tickling your creativity side? Uh, and financial reality is a really big one that people kind of forget about, oh. especially when you're building a business. <laughs> you're pushing your creative yeah. and your finances. Yeah, don't forget here. about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so being able to kind of look. So make sure all those. So you would say for you, happiness and fulfillment would be is when you're actively um, exploring all those areas. Yeah. Like I want the creative outlet. I want the job that brings me amazing finances. I like the people in my life who are like behind my back and supporting me. Um, I like my body to feel healthy and yummy and active. Like all of those things. And I think so often we only go off of like one thing or we get stuck on one path. So the fulfilled life for me is everything's working and grooving along. (laughs) Okay. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. I love that. I haven't heard that one yet. So that's great. Um, all right. So let's dive a little bit deeper into what you do. So please tell us about your mental wealth movement and why and how it was created. So it was created maybe like a year or two ago. And I feel like I've always been edging towards that. I was looking at the media and there are so many conversations about mental health these days, which is awesome. People are getting help. They're having more acceptance of it. So it's not as stigmatized. I think it's great, but it's only the beginning. I mean, really and truly what changed things for me is when I stopped trying to maintain myself in a sense of equilibrium and really started to push my edge creatively and actually looking at what is strong about me, what is right about me, what's been right about me all along. So the mental wealth movement is really that. It's um, I wrote an article for Maria Shriver um, this magazine when my book first came out a couple of years ago. And one of the tools I had said was basically, you're going to be adding little coins to your wealth bucket. So doing things that actually like lift you up, doing things that make you successful and really looking mm. at unique ways, right? It's not like the one path that makes us a success. Um, so it's kind of more of that idea, being a little bit more generative in your living instead of just being like, I'm not an overt pain, peace out, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I work with people on that, on that well. So usually there are people who are a little bit more in the corporate realm. Um, a lot of times I'm working with perfectionist women. I wonder why they find me. <laughs> you kind of attract what you are. Uh, <laughs> so people like me who have advanced degrees and are really moving and grooving, but are kind of like, again, my, maybe my career path is super great, but my relationships and, you know, that creative spark isn't there. So it's, it's Uh really trying to help people be a wealth of being out in the world and being that ripple effect. 
All right. Um, so uh, piggybacking off of that, so what advice would you give people um, that maybe in like your case, having a mental illness or ha- being different in any way, but still, how do you, what advice would you give these people in order to not let that get in their way of starting a business or having any roadblocks mm-hmm. in their life, not using it as an excuse to, you know, not do what they really dream of doing? Yeah. Well, you have to stop looking at it as a liability and start looking at it as an asset. And simple, 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 just take a skill inventory, get a sheet of paper out, write down all the things that you do well, Uh, look at the things people compliment you on. Or sometimes it's more idiosyncratic than that, where it's like, you know, I just notice when I talk, people listen. That's something. I notice when I'm listening to somebody, they actually open up a lot. That's a skill set in of itself. There's a lot of jobs based off of that. Um, I'm the one sitting in the room seeing what nobody else does, and I feel really weird about it. But at the same time, that's an angle we could take and have innovation. So it's these little, and when you're diagnosed with it, I mean, you think of like autism, ADHD, uh, you talk about the mental health disorders. A lot of times those people have super abilities because they're Mm -hmm. dialed up in intensity in those areas. But if you can start looking at those kind of things and writing it down and what jobs, what career, how can you put yourself out there that actually plays to your strength? That's really where things will start to change for you. So getting really granular with it, write it down, keep a running list. Um, I also find things that you were really judged for. Those belong on the list too, because a lot of times people were trying to shut you down. Oh, wow. Okay. So like one client I worked with, she was so interesting. She was, um, she's like, yeah, I would always get in trouble because I would talk during class. I would never be quiet. I was always in the principal's office. Well, now she's an interviewer. She's quite successful (laughs) at it because she knows that when she just listens and shows up for somebody, they shine and she loves having other people shine. So she found a career that played to the weird strength that got her in trouble when she was little. So you got to think outside the box, you know? I love that. I love that really being, you know, uh, being self aware of your, your strengths or how your things that might have been looked at as a weakness that how you can use that as a strength. (laughs) Now, the the talking about self awareness. So you said that this could be the greatest um, self care tool, right? The self awareness. Can you talk a little bit about that and teach us more? Yeah, I have a really different view on self-care. Like I love massages. I'm a yoga teacher. I meditate. I love all the things, you know, you'll catch me at the spa, definitely. Um, But what hit me on my journey is I was, I was yoga, meditation, I was doing all the right things. But I noticed that day in, day out, when stress hit, I didn't know how to take care of myself in that situation. So it wasn't that I was taking care of me in my living. It was that I was taking care of me as a vacation or an offshoot to kind of counterbalance, which most of us do. Mm -hmm. So for me, self-awareness is self-care because if you can be aware of yourself and what you require and you can build your backbone up to ask for it, that is going to take care of your needs all through your life like nothing else. So for me, that is like the hallmark of my work is really how do you take care of yourself? Because we're all so different. We all require different things. And you really have to build that muscle of, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed in this situation. I need to leave. Or, um, you know, this is more of a draining thing. I don't have the energy for it. I just have to learn to say no. Or I need to put myself in this circumstance. Otherwise, I'm never going to launch my business. I have to get a big shove in the right direction. Uh, You have to kind of learn how you tick and then create the environment to really play to that strength. Okay. Can you give uh, more examples of what that looks like? Like an example of a stressful situation at that moment, like how do I switch gears or how do I see, how do I build that list of things that can be a self-care item for me to snap out of it? Yeah. So a couple of things with that, when you are not in the stressful circumstance, go ahead and make a list, keep it on your iPhone. That's what I do. So it's readily available of things that make you feel like yourself. Things that fill you up. So for me, something as simple as reading a book. I'm a big book nerd. I love to read. That's on my list. Time in nature. (laughs) Um, Different forms of yoga. I have a running list so that when I am hyper stressed, I've got something to go back to. Uh Um, So that's super helpful kind of as a toolkit moving throughout your day. And then you have to really... 
I find so many people when they're in the situation, they don't know how to care for themselves because they don't know how to like identify what they actually need. For me, I had to take physical space to find that out. And I mean, I'm on the middle of a date. I can't (laughs) tell if I'm attracted to him or he's just so attracted to me that I'm kind of getting into it. I would go to the bathroom and I would stay in there as long as it took to get some physical space, to get his energy out of my energy and to kind of see, is this something I would like to pursue? It's a silly example, but that happens all the time. You're in the middle of a business meeting and things get heated. You know, taking a break, getting some physical space, especially at the very beginning when you're playing with this is super helpful. I had to do that a lot. And then when you build the muscle, you don't need to go to the bathroom. You can just take a breath, take a beat and move forward. But you may need that as a kind of interrupt at the beginning. Yeah, I feel like a lot of times we don't take a moment to think or breathe before just talking. You know, we don't process it. We just do auto responses because we just think we have to. But I think um, it is a practice. We need to learn that it's okay to stay quiet for a moment to think through or to even just simply say, I don't know right now. Let me get back to you. I feel like that's something I had to really learn in my in my business journey because I would always want to just give an answer, right? I want to have a solution. I'm very solution oriented, but I learned that, Hey, no, like instead of just either making something up or trying to like rush through this, it's okay to say, Hey, I don't know, but let me do some research or figure it out. Let me think it through and I'll, I'll let you know. I was getting in a lot of trouble by agreeing to a lot of things that when I thought through it, I was like, no, this makes no business sense to me. Like I'm going to lose money in this situation. Why would I, why would I make this deal? Right. Um, but I think that's the biggest tool. I learned I learned to like say hey I'm gonna get back to you and really take a day or so to process it before making any any big decisions especially gotta sleep on it there's nothing wrong with that and I think sometimes sometimes depending on who you're talking to if you're on like a sales call you have to understand they're intentionally building pressure to push a sale (laughs) and it's so funny because I've been on so many of them like myself as the client being sold to and I'm like I know the tactics I've been trained I know what they're doing but I still feel like let me pull my credit card out it's a 10% off if I do it right now instead of being like you know what it's worth not saving the 10% to make sure I'm aligned with this I'm going to get back to you and I had a coach once I was um this was a couple years ago I was she was a marketing person and she's so funny she said Lauren do you know why I want your credit card now? And I said, because if people get off the phone with you, you never hear from them again. And she goes, exactly. And I'm like, but what if that's like aligned with what they want to do? (laughs) But of course I paid her money and then I had to try to get it back later. It was a hot mess. But um, I think when you're a people person, a people pleaser, and again, you have that perfectionist tendency or you get looped into other people's wants and desires easy and you don't really know what you need. um, It's really easy to fall prey for that even when you know the backdoor stuff. So take some space. I mean, same, like even, even simply the sales item, my husband always falls for the sales, the emails, everything. I'm like, babe, but do you need it? Like, do you need it? Because you can buy it when you need it, whatever it is. Like, but no, it's such a good deal. And I feel like <laughs> in my experience too, I've learned to just not even look at it. I'm like, okay, if I need it, then I'll look for the best deal based on like this thing that I need instead of buying something just because it's a good deal. But um, yeah, like you said, even if we're aware of the sales tactics, you know, like one easy one is, hey, we only have one left in stock. Like, are you going to take it? It's you know that's not true. Out. And you know, it's not true a lot of the times. And I had a person, I had a best friend in retail and she told me this, and this was for kind of like expensive watches even. And even knowing that it's, it's tempting. You're like, Oh my God, but I like it. Like it's the last one. Let me get it. But, um, but yes, we just need to know, okay, just think about it, you know, take a moment, step back, even if it's go to maybe if it's if it's a purchase item, go to one or two stores and then see if you really are still thinking about it at the end of your shopping, they then go back and purchase the item. It means you probably you really want it. You're not just pressured to get it. Um, anyway, so let's move on from that. <laughs> um, um, as far as um, taking other people's like uh, view of you or image of you or what what 
they may what other people may see you as um i know that's very dangerous but what can you share about that how like i know it's dangerous we all know we shouldn't care what people think of us we shouldn't care what how other people see us but how do we actually not care (laughs) um and just really focus on what we want and who we want to see ourselves as yeah, I think it's a, it's a learning process for all of it. And it's so funny because there's certain things that trigger you, right? Like we all have our personal triggers. So when somebody judges me as something and I know that's not true or it's not a trigger for me, I'm kind of like, well, that's their stuff, not my stuff. Okay. And then other times when they do that, but it's a trigger for me, like I had somebody at work a couple of years ago call me mean and I'm their supervisor. I work in a big system at the hospital. I have to hold people accountable. This is my job. Um, but to have that label put on, I was so, it, it threw me and it still, it kind of creeped into my subconscious a little bit where for some reason it was such a big trigger. And so sometimes if that's happening for you and you're getting really looped in, take a look back at your history. For me, it was way more important for people to like me and to think I was nice. That was the way I was raised was to be nice and pleasing. And I also have a very direct personality. And sometimes I'm, I'm like, I'm so friendly and I'm just really sweet. And yes, but at the same time, my undercurrent is quite direct and powerful. And so sometimes I don't have a really good view of myself. Yeah, where... I could relate. I'm totally like that. Yep. And so, but when you've been raised to be sweet and nice and pleasing, but you kind of have this more powerhouse thing, sometimes you don't see clearly. And I'm like, I could see where, I could see where maybe she called me a bitch. I'm sorry if I curse a little bit, but I could, I could, I could see that, but like calling me mean, that was such a trigger for me because it was the opposite of the nice. And so I had to really do a lot of work on myself with that. Um, so I feel like some people, some things are going to trigger you more than others. You have to do a deep dive with that to finally release it. And then, um, I think overall it just gets really tricky. You have to realize that most people are just Hector, the projectors. And that's in my head all the time when somebody is saying something to me, this is Hector, the projector here. They are taking their stuff and seeing me through their filter. They're not really here Uh. with me. And that's very helpful, too, because that judgment will get thrown at you. That's just the way life is. Um, But it's easier to lay down and let it go. The only time I really carry it with me these days is when I get, it's like a trigger thing for me, like a certain (laughs) word or a certain energy. Yeah. Yeah. Then I have to do deep dives. Yeah. (laughs) So just being aware of your kind of like your red buttons, I call them my red buttons, are certain things that would just make me really tick, right? And I'm aware of those things when that does happen, then I'm like, okay, no, I need to, I need some time, I need some time to work on myself. Well, it's it's good too, um, because you don't have control over them. They're going to keep judging. mm -hmm. You have no control over that, but you do have control about how you react to it. So if you can watch your red buttons and work your way through, that takes your power back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, being in charge of other people, it's really challenging when overall, I think most people, especially women who are raised to be nice and pleasing and friendly. Um, but when it comes down to having to that power shift, and if somebody like we, no matter how much we know, we shouldn't care to be liked or not liked. everybody wants to be liked, right? <laughs> Deep down, we all still want to be liked. But I think um, what's one thing my husband had always told me is like, look, just do your job, do your job well, be a fair person. And you can't control if people like you or not. Most of the time, just even the, the dynamic of you being their boss, automatically people think they're not, they, they're not going to like their boss. (laughs) Because a lot of times, you know, that's just what's out there. And that's what people think they shouldn't like their boss. Um, But I think what has helped me is that, okay, don't worry about being nice or being liked as long as you're fair. And I think that's how I've run my business and it has worked really well for me. I always ask, okay, if I'm doing this, obviously I always want to be as nice as possible, but I always say, okay, is this fair? Like, is this fair for me, for the business and for the employee or whatnot? And it has worked pretty well. I think Um, I haven't really had issues with people once I started, you know, running things that way. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about your book. So please share the title again. Um, it's called the other side of bipolar, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us what that means? And, um, 
at this point, where are you with, with that journey? So what does the book mean to you? And what does the title mean exactly? So the title is really like what's beyond the label. And what's beyond the label is you in your entirety, in your beauty, in all your imperfections. It's what makes you human. And I went through this and I talked to so many people since where you win a label, you have a diagnosis given to you and it becomes your self-identity and all other paths to self-exploration really stop. So for me, the other side of bipolar is actually walking through the label limitation and discharging Mm. it so that you're able to actually be a full person. And it doesn't become the elephant in the room anymore. It might be a part of you, but it is not the entirety of you. And it's also not like a predictor of your future. So a lot of people are like, that's what I was told when I was 14. Look, you're always going to struggle. You shouldn't really push yourself a whole bunch. You won't be able to handle stress. I was told to stay away from people-based professions because I was so empathetic, but that's my strong point. I've worked in the ICU for 18 years with stroke victims right after their injury. My coaching business gets really raw and deep with people. I would be shortchanging the world had I followed that advice. Wow. So you're a walking model, actually, of how to not let that um, limit you, basically, that you can still be as normal as anybody else, even with a specific diagnosis, specific like label attached to you shouldn't pay attention to it. Basically, Mm -hmm. you do what's best for you. And there's always a way to use whatever you have um, as as part of your strengths instead of letting it um, limit you in your journey. Yeah. And it's a process, you know, this wasn't an overnight thing. It kind of chronicles me through 15 <laughs> years of my journey of digging into this system and going over here and trying this. And I always tell people, yeah, but yeah. So sorry to cut you off, but you know, somebody who does is specifically, let's say somebody who does have a mental illness, hearing your story, hearing your journey, it's very, very inspiring to be like, Hey, like, I don't have to let this get in my way. Right. I don't have to let this limit me that I can't have decent relationships. I have to worry about not taking x y and z type of jobs because they told me i won't be good at it so i just love love sharing that because i'm a big believer of like we are really in control of our lives and how we want to live it no matter what right so um i just wanted to really point that out and really congratulate you on going through that journey because you're giving so many people hope that hey i can have a amazing life no matter what labels are put on me thank you for that yeah and that's the hope and that's so far what i I've received. It's just, you know, it's whenever you put something out in the world, you're a business person, you get it. It's just getting it in front of more people. Um, Cause really that's mm-hmm. why we're here is to be that ripple effect. So my, my question I always ask is, you know, how many people can I touch with my awareness? And it's not that I know everything. It's just, I have awareness of self awareness of the journey and awareness mm-hmm. of how it kind of worked in my own space that I'd like to touch as many people as possible with that. Cause I've seen the change, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, definitely it's life-changing it's it really could be life-changing now um uh, let's focus a little bit more on our my entrepreneur listeners Uh, what advice would you have for them to get them into the because we know mindset is really important right and being resilient in business is also really important because there's going to be lots of ups and downs so what advice do you have to get them into the right mindset build resilience and really like see things through instead of just giving up (laughs) when things get tough. I would say just make sure whatever you're pursuing lights you up. And you also need to know that it's going to light you up at the beginning and it may shift and change later. Um, It's interesting because I feel like a lot of us go through functional burnout. And for me, burnout doesn't look because I've got tons of energy. Um, burnout doesn't really look like I'm on the sofa or I'm sick and I can't do things. I always have the energy to push through. My burnout looks more like boredom and lack of enthusiasm. So a lot of times you just have to really be watching for that. If you're saying yes to a lot of things because other people expect you to do it, 
because it's the way that's supposed to work. I've fallen into that trap like way more times than I would like to admit to. Um, Even like I would always look at my audience, like once I kind of launched everything and I'm like, well, what do you need to hear next? And being led by them is actually not the most aligned thing. You have to really tap back into you. Um, I think you need to listen and pay attention to what's responding, how people are responding to. You can get nuggets of, okay, cool. That thing really works and people need it. But when you are blatantly like, I'm not quite sure what's next, you tell me, that's where we get into messy territory and where that functional burnout can happen. Mm. So make sure it lights you up at the beginning. Be wary because that light up is going to shift and change as you go through different stages. And it's never wrong to be able to like take a break. And I think some of it is the algorithms on social media. Like for me, my (laughs) podcast, I like, I did one every week for two years. And then I was like, you know what? I just don't really have as much to say anymore. I need to take the summer off. And it's amazing because the algorithm went down. So when I launched my next one, it wasn't as like populous. So I feel like there's this undercurrent constantly of trying to get in front of people, trying to stay top of mind and working the algorithm. Yeah, there's tons of pressure to create and put the content out there where that may not be your natural ebb and flow. You really have to tap into yourself and start here and then go out. And that's what I'm working on constantly with myself is do I have energy for this? And is this something that really makes me feel alive? Or is this more of a to do thing that I'm sludging through? Yeah, I could totally feel that. I mean, honestly, I've been that type of creator or entrepreneur. I was like, if I feel like it, I'm going to do it. If not, it's never end of the world. There always would be more time, more opportunity, more things. Um, because I, I realized like the more I thought about doing things perfectly, trying to do things even consistently, it just doesn't work. It really doesn't work for, for, for my creative side. So I've learned to not care about that part of it just put out as much as I can, um, whatever it is, you know, if it's my, my work, always do my best, but definitely like take a break. If I need to not worry about, Hey, I need to do X, Y, and Z because of the algorithm, (laughs) because this is what people need to see because all that, because just that pressure alone can really be such a drainer. And, and then it makes you not love what you do. And that's already going to put you on the wrong path, right? We want to always be enjoying our craft and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's really, truly when you're going to create magic, right? If at any point you feel like you're not enjoying it, you need to sit down and be like, okay, what do I need to do different? I think too, it's so interesting because people create differently. Some people are able to like slow play it and they're just like a constant in the background, super consistent. And that works for their energy signature. Uh, For me, I do burst, start, stop, start, stop. When I have something that wants to get created, like my book out in three months, it's 250 pages. Wow. So it's it's wow. like those things. Congratulations. <laughs> and it's so fascinating because sometimes I judge myself. That's a personal judgment of I don't have the slow and steady for that consistency. I've got the burst. And when nothing's coming, I'm like, I get so frustrated. But I'm like, you know, this is kind of how it's been. I know there's things getting created. There's a timing component that I'm very tuned into. And so it looks like I stop, but really I'm just waiting for that next burst to come through. Right. And you Thank never you. lose it. You repurpose content. You can go back to old contexts. I think um, I think there's a lot of lies right now in entrepreneurship that you have to just keep going and never, ever stop. And if you do, you're going to lose it. I don't think that's true at all. Yeah, I have to agree on that. I really do. Because if you once you start forcing it, things just don't work the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. So we are getting tight on time. So I'll ask you a um, couple of last questions. So tell um, us where people can find you and also um, your last words of encouragement for our listeners. So the easiest place is laurenpolly.com. That's got the link to my book and also my podcast, which is a 15-minute download, basically. It's just kind of me talking about my weird point of view on the world and what's going on. And again, people get to walk with me through it. So it's delicious. It's very relaxing and yummy. Um, And then last words of wisdom, I would just say, what if what was wrong about you in your own inner dialogue was actually your greatest asset in disguise? Hmm. Thought provoking question. Yeah. Yes. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much. And that leaves our listeners with a lot to think about. Literally everybody, like you need to sit down and write down your, your weaknesses yeah. <laughs> and, um, and see how you can use them. But again, thank you so, so much, Lauren, for your time and your advice and all your hard work and everything that you work through in order to be an example for our listeners and share your story. I really, really appreciate people like you and especially taking the time to share it with the world um thank you again so nice to meet with you and talk with you and hopefully we can stay in touch and and meet again soon thank you yegi thank you thank you for listening please rate and review this podcast follow and engage with us on social media under the yegi project and if you're interested in being a guest email info at the and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes